Oh, good morning, let's get started. Finally got the Windows thing to boot up and go into PowerPoint. Um, I can't believe OIT has so much trouble getting that one machine to work. Every time I send a message, they say, oh, it'll be fixed kind of stuff, right? So, um, how's everyone doing? Oh, good. So, uh, again, I'll be out of town on, on Friday. The TA will be here and he'll go through the fuse, um, how to use them and stuff, right? So, and he has only one class, so I suggest that you actually uh, go over the example. Um, on the example directory, there should be a hello.c, which is a very simple program. Um, so just go through it, kind of get a sense of how things are, and he'll tell you how to mount the fuse file system, unmount it, and so on and so forth. Um, you'll get a lot more out of it if you know what he's talking about kind of stuff, right? So in, in the project, the, 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 the guts of what you're going to do is on the, the, your disk and you know, writing the directories and all those things, not on the, the fuse side, right? The fuse side should be fairly straightforward. You just call your functions from the fuse, fuse side, right? So hopefully after you, go, you know, after you go through the demo, uh, you'll get past the fuse component. Because if you wait till the last moment and you try to get the fuse component up, it's easy, but nothing is ever easy when you're on a deadline, um, especially on, on, on systems kind of stuff, right? So um, use, make the most use of it. He'll go through what has to be done, but if you have more questions, that's a good place to bring it up, right? So do you have any questions on what we covered so far? So at the end, I kind of went through the, you know, the, the notion of sharing in um, AFS very quickly, right? And if you didn't, if you didn't quite catch it, I'll be, I'll be willing to talk to you offline. It's not part of the course because you know to get to that point in the distributed systems course, you have to build to quite a quite a while, right? And I'm consciously not adding any distributed systems concepts at all in the OS because I want you to understand what happens on a single machine. But you have to know that once you try to go global, then a lot of the things that you can do here won't apply, and this is one of those, right? If you have a single machine, uh, you, can, you can make sure that all the data structures are consistent, but when you move across machines, either within the same campus, within the same um, city, or across the planet, the time it takes to make, make things slow down so much that you have to weaken some of these guarantees. And that's, that's one of the things you'll see on the file systems that you don't see on a memory-based system because the previous module, everything was within a single machine, right? So the OS pretty much knew what was happening on the system, not so for distributed systems, right? And you see that in the locking, and you see them in the consistency and all those things, right? So in terms of sharing, right? So one of the key things to remember is in the file system, the operating system which actually writes the file need not be the operating system which reads the same file, right? Either because it, you got rebooted or because the file went from one machine to another machine. So if it's a CD-ROM or something, you take it from one ma machine to another machine. If it's a USB key or any of those things, it could be on a different, totally different machine. Or it could be that you rebooted and you forgot the whole thing, right? So everything, every notion of users, groups, and all those things have to be written to the file, unlike the memory memory stuff, right? In the memory stuff, if the OS forgets who belongs to who's the owner of the particular page, you're in serious trouble anyway, right? At that, at that point, you you might also reboot the machine. Whereas here, that's the norm, right? So the notion of user ID and group ID sort of existed on the on the on the memory memory side, but you could get away with not writing it so you know to the to a stable storage. And here's the notion permeates the system. So here file systems are designed to last practically forever. So you have to know, have the notion of users and groups and stuff to figure out who can share, who, who not to share. So the OS does not actually know. It has to go to the file system to see are you allowed to open the file, right? And if you want to give somebody permission, you write something onto the file system, and then you read from the file system, right? So is that clear? So that, that's, that's one way to think about what's the difference between the, the prior section and this section. So the notion of user, so there's a notion of users and groups. A user, as you imagine, is an individual person. In groups, you expect to have multiple users. And you can have many groups, right? You know, depending on what the operating system is, you can have many different groups. And then you can assign different privileges to different groups. Right? So for example, you guys may belong to undergrads. You may belong to um, 
computer science, you may belong to engineering, and, and so on and so forth. And depending on which group you are, I may give you different privileges, and, um, and, and so on. Right? And when you go to security, we'll, we'll say a little bit about how you get added, how you get deleted, for now, as soon as you have a concept of groups and stuff. And this is what, uh, what I uh, mentioned before, you know, the, uh, the consistency semantics, right? Essentially, when you have two entities operating on a single file, what should the semantics be, right? If it's on a, so Unix file system, if you assume it's on a single machine with, with both the users on the single machine, can support a, con, uh, a model where if this process writes something, this will immediately see it, right? There's no, the, the, the notion of clock and everything is, is easier, right? How many of you have any distributed systems background? Oh, good. So, if you go to distributed systems, one of the hardest, so none of you have said yes, right? So, if you go to distributed systems, one of the hardest things to deal with is the notion of time, right? And it actually goes a little bit into relativity theory kind of notions, right? So, when you have two independent machines, and this writes, and this reads, right? So let's say this happens first, and this happens next, right? If you are an oracle and you can look at the whole system as is, then you can have the notion this happened first and this happened next. But within the system, the happens, you know, what happens after, before, depends on when somebody sees the consequence, right? So if, if this, to an observer here, right, what they see is the order of when things happen, or that's the only thing you can implement, right? So if this sent it at absolute time, let's say 10 o'clock, and this sent it at absolute time 10.01, right? But if this sees it at 10.05, and this sees it at 10.04 for whatever reason, right? This fact is irrelevant, right? You can't, you can't really propagate that because you, you can only watch what you see, right? And this is sort of similar to the relativity kind of concepts, and that, that is the reason why the distributed systems get so complicated, right? The, the notion of what, what we say in the Unix file system where I write first and then you read cannot be implemented as easily, right? The read, read first, read second depends on the, on the time, right? If these things are kind of complicated, you know, um, that's, that's a separate course, but I, I just want to give a hint of why it's not so trivial, why I can't just add another slide on how to do the distributed systems, right? So, you had a question? I was going to ask, this is sort of unrelated, but on Unix, when you use the command change mod, mm -hmm. chmod, mm -hmm. what are the permissions that you're working with there? So, within Unix, the traditional old fashioned Unix, you have user, group, and others, right? User is you, and group is, you're only allowed to be in one group, and other is everybody else, right? And you operate on read, write, x, write, read, write, execute, read, write, execute. There are other bits, you can set a sticky bit, right? And you can do a set UID bit, right? Which is, this essentially says that, so, so these are clear, right? This means that you are allowed to read or write or execute, you're allowed to read or write or execute, read or write or execute to others and stuff, right? So if you run this program as it, so if I, if I give the permission as read, write, x, and you run the program, the program will, in, will be run as you, right? And if, if somebody else runs the program, it'll be run as them. If I want the program to be forced to run as somebody else, right? So for example, this file belongs to me. Right? So if I set the sticky bit here, and you run the program, then the program will be run as me. Because I, I, I set the sticky bit, so anybody runs the program will be run as me. Right? So there are little variants like that. You, you can set the T bit and all those things. So, um, so those, those are the, for the files. Right? For the directory, X means search. Right? So if you have directory and you don't have X privileges, that means I can't search. Um, so you can't do a ls because ls is really listing the directory, so you can't, you can't do that. You can't actually go into the directory. Uh, and you can you know, 
played uh, games with that. So more different systems have notions of access control groups and stuff, so they can, they can add other stuff. So you know, Linux, um, you might have heard of ACLs. We'll see a little bit on the, the, the next um, module, right? But essentially, you can, you can create better, better options than this, and you can have a, a bigger set of groups, right? And those are additions which were, which were made, right? The history behind this is back before the grandfather, the father of Unix is Multics, which had a notion of a, lot, a whole bunch of users and groups and stuff. And that proved to be too complicated, so we went to this three model, which served us fine for the most part, except now we're kind of going back, right? So, so depending on if I have the right privileges and if you share, open the fi file for sharing, then whatever one process writes, the other will be able to read it. And of course, AFS and NFS have uh, complicated semantics, right? And in some sense, you ha really have to know what AFS does because if you use the, the Notre Dame network, Notre Dame either uses AFS, right? If you're using the um, your AFS directory is, is either on AFS or if you're using Windows, they export the file system as SIFS, right, which is a Windows file system, right? In the lab, we, I use NFS, right? So you rarely use a Unix file system for any of your work, right? So if you want to develop a code where two of you have to share something using writing, none of what I say apply, because you need to, we don't actually use a uh, Unix file system, right? Except for the directory called slash temp, which is where you can write, and that tends to be um, Unix file system, right? Technically, this could be a RAM file system where this is returned to a uh, memory, not to actual disk, right? But regardless, this this one can have the semantics we're talking about. Your home directories, you have to understand how these things uh, would would happen. So, and and if you Within AFS, right, the privileges, so within, if you use AFS, the privileges come to you from AFS and not from, uh, from the Unix, right? So if you use AFS, um, how, many, how many use AFS on a, so quite a few of you use AFS, right? So AFS, even though it, used, it seems to use Unix, it, it actually uses, goes through Kerberos, right? And Kerberos provides a lot more functionality than just read, write, execute. It gives, gives you read, write, execute. Um, I forget all the list and archive and stuff, right? Um, list, I guess list, append, this archive, and so on and so forth, right? AFS does support a whole, whole notion of groups and everything. So, um, so within the AFS model, I can give you a lot more privileges than just read, write, execute. I can give you more privileges, right? So within the Unix model, you know, you have the, the um, so by, remember when I said the open file, I used a 066, right? So within C, zero at the beginning means it's an octal, right? It's an octal number. So this would mean, Right, in octal, this would be the binary representation of this octal number, right? So read this as read, write, x, read, write, x, read, write, x, right? So when I say I want to open a file as 0660, I'm setting it as, this is for user, group, others. So I'm setting it as read, x for user, Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, so otherwise you'll have, uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, 660 would be, yeah, for a file you, you wouldn't want to set the execute bit, thanks for that. Yeah, you wouldn't want to set the execute bit for files. Yeah, so you would want to do that. So, yeah, so essentially you figure out what more, more do you want write them in binary, convert them into octal, and um, you, know, you can do it in hex or whatever, but octal is a you know, easier form to do that. Right? 
so you know that essentially creates. So if you can create the, um, you can use the, the commands like change, you know, change group, change, ch change owner, and, and change modes in, in Unix to set these bits for the files. Right? And for Windows, if you open a file and look at the properties, you might have seen something like this. You know, it gives you the um, the set of privileges. You know, the at the, at the bottom, right? And the set of users who are assigned to it. So if you click on each user, it tells you what they're allowed and what they're, what they're denied. Right? So it, it has much richer set of uh, group members rather than just a group. Right? So the, the, you belong to a user, and there's administrator who can, can do stuff, and there are different groups you can, you can do this stuff. Right? And again, within uh, Unix, if you print the ls minus l directory, the first column shows the different parameters. So it says, you know, read, write for the first uh, first file. Second one is a directory, so it says d and what the privileges are, and so on, right? So, so that 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 concludes the notion of like what files are, what directories are, and stuff. So that's a high level notion of what we operate with, yeah. Does the operating system ever define permissions on a per-directory basis? Or is it always every file has the... So if you don't have certain, so um, it, it again depends on the particular operating system, right? So if you don't have certain privileges on the directory, you may not be able to do some things on the file. Um, so for example, if I set the directory to be not readable by you, then you won't be able to read the directory to figure out what file is? I mean, at, at some at some base level, directory is just one file that you have to read to see where where the files are. So if I can't read the directory, I can't read where the file is. Yeah. So when you say you can't read the directory, then you can't read where the file is. Does that mean like you couldn't do an ls on it, or no. does it mean you can't even access the file? You can't do ls. You can't access the file. Even if you know the name, you can't access the file. But if, if somebody told you the name, you just you couldn't even do it. You shouldn't be able to. Okay. But again, it depends on what the OS defines as what should be done, right? right. Um, yeah. Where are the permissions stored? Are they stored with the actual files, or are they stored at some header in the file system? So they have to be stored in the in the in, in the in the disk, right? So the good place to store them would be with the directory. We'd say so to have file control block. We'll see what what file control block is. But essentially, it has to be stored on the disk. Some data structure which depends on every file, right? So so it defines what the file is, all the permissions and all the other characteristics of a file. Similar to a process control block, but it should live on the file file system. We'll, we'll, I think I think we have a slide in a few things, right? In a, in a couple of slides, right? Essentially, yeah. Essentially, the key to remember is anything you have to do with the file system has to be returned to the file, right? The OS cannot keep them in memory. So if it, if you have a notion of a user permissions, it has to be on the storage, right? It has to be somewhere on the storage which can be found and all those things. Nothing is ever kept in the memory. It has to go on the disk. So now, now we now we look at you know how how you might implement a file system, right? And we've given enough hints on how, how we may go about doing this stuff. So the, the, the first notion is, you know, you have the, if you have this as a disk, right? So I think we, we mentioned it in last class. You have to have some notion to figure out. So if, you, if you're going to split, split them into partitions, right? You have to have something up here which says that there's a notion of partitions, right? There's something you have to read here uh, called the boot, boot control block which tells you how to read information about partitions. And once you read this, you know that there's a partition here, there's a partition here. And your particular operating system may know how to deal with this partition, may not know how to deal with the partition, right? Regardless, it has to know how, to, it has to know that the partition exists, right? So for example, if this happens to be a um, Linux file system, right? And this happens to be a Windows file system, right? If you want both the machines to know they exist, the boot control block has to say there's a partition called Linux here, there's a partition called Windows here. Windows may not know what to do with the Linux partition, but it has to know it exists. If it doesn't, it'll just wipe it out, right? Windows actually wipes it out for other reasons, but um, it has to know that, that, that it exists, right? And the same for, for Linux. If Linux has to be booted in this machine, it has to know how to read this file because otherwise the machine cannot work. It does not have to know how to read the Windows file system, 
but it has to know it exists. And the way it knows it exists is you boot sector, which all these systems have to be able to read. If a particular machine does not know how to read this stuff, then it'll most likely ask you, do you want to format the disk, right? You might have seen it in some cases where you put some CD and it says, I don't understand what the format is, do you want me to reformat, right? Um, which is a kind of bad way to say it because it, it doesn't know how to deal with it. The solution is not to wipe out whatever it doesn't know, but um, so, So anyway, so so you know the boot control box tells you you know what to proceed. Volume control box tells you stuff about volume or the partition, right? Which tells you how big they are. Um, what so, so within these stuff, you are free to change the allocation, all those things, the way it, it, it's meant for Linux, right? So you can choose a different blocks, or you can you can do whatever parameter here. This is completely independent of this one, right? So you have to define what you're doing at this part. You know what kind of file system, what's the block size, and what's the um, and so on and so forth, right? You know, the free block and block pointers and all those things. None of how you do it here need make any sense for this file system, right? So you have to define all the stuff here. So in your, in your, for your homework project, we, we don't really care about this because your machine, your program only needs to work with your file system, right? But within here, you define your data structure, right? So if I take one project group's disk and I give it to another person's disk, right? It most likely will crash, right? Because you you don't know how to deal read, uh, read the particular system. I'm, I'm not saying that all of you use, have to use the same exact data structure, right? Since you don't do that, I can't just swap the disk across different users, right? But within your own group, you have to be able to read your own file system, right? If you if you don't, then we have serious problems, right? And so you know, within the file system, you have notions of I notes and all the things. We'll, we'll see what they are in a little bit, right? So at, at the at a high level, your application programs deal with it as a logical file system, and um, you know, you, you you essentially boil it down to the at the disk level as blocks and 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 bytes and so on, right? So the the notion of file control block, right? So this has to exist within your file system, right? Which is sort of what she was asking, you know, where do you put all the stuff? So for each file, you have to have a notion of a file control block, which tells you information about the particular file. You know, for example, the permissions, when it was created, when it was deleted, and all those things, the access control list, the file size, and where the actual blocks are, right? So the idea here is, what we call as a file.c, right? So you need to have the the permissions, the the dates, right? As many, you know, create, modify, whatever you want to add here. At the end, you have to point to the actual block which will have your let's say this is your program, right? So this defines so you need to open this to figure out if you have the privileges, and then if you have the privileges, track down the pointer to figure out where the actual data is, right? So this is, even though this is what we call as file, if you don't know how to read this, you can't read this, right? And this has to be a block, and this has to be a block. So on this, on the disk, right, if they are using constant size uh, blocks, right, this will be, let's say, block one. Let's say this is. Right? On the disk, it's all blocks, right? Like sort of what you'll do for your homework project, you do read disk and write disk, right? So this block points to block to which has the actual data, right? So within the directory, so if you have directory structure, right, it has to point to block one. So the way you would start off with, you read the directory to figure out information about the file to figure out where the data is, right? Yeah. Um, for the file control block, mm -hmm. other than big endian versus little endian, mm -hmm. is it pretty much the same for Windows, Linux, um, different? No, it, it's it's completely up to them. It doesn't have to be different, but it oh. always is different. Think of it as like within a class, right? How likely do you think all of you are going to come up with the same exact data structure, right? It may happen because in in, in this case you're you're going for a very simple file system, but real file systems are a lot more complicated. So, um, no chances are you won't happen. Right? 
to, to, to give you an example, the, the owner group and access control list, right? Depending on what, what kind of file system you use, they have totally different meaning in what they do, right? So that structure changes, uh, permission changes, dates change, right? Um, so, no, I mean, you, you can't yeah. send them. I mean, them. I don't mean to get off track, but like if you make a text file saying in Windows, it, it just opens on Linux or vice versa. So is there some way that it can tell by looking at the file that? Yeah, let, let's, let's get to that a little bit, right? Oh, okay. No, that, that's an excellent question because so one of the problems is everybody designs their own file system which helps, which works, you know, good for them, right? And, and that, that's well and good because you, you, you may have a pet file system which works really good. But within the next, I think it, it, acts, it understands 14 different file systems, right? And, the, and there are more coming as, as, as we go along, right? Which is all fine for some techie person to understand all the file system, but for users don't really care, right? So you have to have a notion of a virtual file system and you operate through those, right? So within, the, so if you look, if you know what you look for, you actually see that there are different file systems, right? And they're all unified to the virtual file system, right? And and the re, and the way you will find the difference is, if you have a unified file system, and you look at it a certain way. Certain operations may or may not exist in a particular file system, right? And th that's precisely what you'll see for your homework project. Right? You're going through the same virtual interface, right? So if your file system may not have a notion of users at all, right? I, I don't suspect that you're going to have a notion of users, right? So your file system will look and act the same, but anybody can be able to modify the file because you don't implement the notion of a user, right? And similarly for Windows, Windows may have a very rich notion of user and stuff, but if you don't know how to map it, then you'll have different results, right? So anyway, so, um, so in terms of you know, the, the data structures in a, in a typical file system, you expect the other user space when you do an open, right? Within the kernel, right, it, has to know, it has to read the, data, the, the directory structure, figure out where the file is, right? and the directory, directory structure may, would, may actually be on, um, on disk, right? So you'll read the disk to figure out the directory structure and figure out where your file is by searching through them. And then it has to read the, the appropriate file control block, right? Um, and it, that's in the second example, right? And then you read the block, right? And actually within the system, since many people can open the same file, you may have a per file, per uh, process file control block and system wide process control block, right? So what might, what might you do on a per process file control block. Can you think of something that would be specific to a f uh, process, right? So here the, the case is two, peop two processes have opened the file, process one and process two, right? And they're trying to open the stuff, right? What information do you think they might keep on a per process uh, basis. Yeah. File pointer. Yeah. So notion of where 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 you are reading, right? So when you do a read, open and read the file, this arrow, right? So I'm I'm reading at this point. You're reading at this point. That information belongs to your process, not to the to the per kernel structure, right? And, but per per kernel kernel structure may keep track of how many people have these things open, right? So it has to know that, so when somebody closes, if everybody closes, then it has to do something and so on, right? So it may have a notion of the, pro, you know, the, the one for per process and one for per system, right? So it has to create all these structures and all these structures would mean that you bring in blocks from the disk and then you send the blocks back, right? And you keep them in the kernel memory, right? So something to think about, which we'll actually look into more in, uh, in um, module, the next module is the kernel memory is essentially your module three, right? All this is being allocated and deallocated the way we defined in module three, right? It's demand page, however want you want to do that, right? So when I want to access a file directory, right? When I want to access a file, let's say I want to access this, get this content, right? I have to read this block, I have to read this block, I have to read this block, I may have to read other blocks, right? And when I read this, I have to keep them in memory somewhere, right? In this, in this, in the middle blue bar, the middle box, I just put it there, right? So if your module three came up and said, 
okay, now that you're using this, I want to throw this half the disk, right? Because it's evicted, because it needs this, right? And so on, right? If it does that, right? Your performance would suffer. Do you see what's going on? Right? A simple operation like reading a file may mean that you need to read multiple data structures. And these multiple data structures may actually exist in multiple uh, disk blocks. So you do a read to get the block into memory. You allocate the memory using the module three concepts. You keep them here and you keep progressing. But if you start throwing this stuff out, then your system will be slow because now you're, you're, you're trying to open a file and the, and the memory system gets in your way, right? So that's one way the interaction really affects you, right? The, 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 the caching that you do for directory structures and files, file structures may not work well with the, the notion of what the, um, what, the, what the process things are doing, right? The process system may say, you're using too much memory, so I'm gonna take this memory off of you, but these pages have a lot more significance than what the process may know and stuff like that, right? And the interactions of how these big things happen are, are, are very important, um, and that's basically buffer cache management, and most, if you look at most of the research by papers, they're trying to make sure that these things are not pasted or are managed properly, right? And, and this is one of the things that if you look at any modern machine, you buy one gig of memory, right? It'll say you have 20 bytes of, I mean, let's say, tw you know, one mega free space, right? You put two megs, you'll say you get one, one mega free space. You put how much memory you have, the system always says it's full, right? How many of you noticed that uh, phenomenon? You keep adding more memory, but your system never will say, you know, you, so you had, let's, let's say you had one, me, one gig, and it said you had 256 meg free, right? When you say, when you add two gig, right? You would never, you would rarely see this much memory free. Right? Has anyone noticed? I guess it's a lot easier on the on the Mac than on the Windows, right? But you never notice this is will get free, right? Because if you see, this will all get allocated to buffer. If you, when you go, you know, when you go back and look at the at the systems, right? You'll see that these pages will keep getting access to some things called buffer, right? So essentially, the free memory may still be 125 meg or something, right? Even though you're adding more memory the system will use that for stuff like cache, which are not assigned to any process, right? It's within a kernel, right? So it's being allocated, it's being used, but not to anything that you can see. So looking at a system to figure out how much memory is being used, is it's pretty hard, and mostly because you're doing, you're, you're trying to manage all these interactions, right? And, and we'll, we'll, we'll spend more time on this stuff, but I just want you to keep thinking about it, right? Because it's, it's not a high-standard concept, right? So essentially, that's what you do. So opening a file means that you have to read a lot of data blocks and stuff. And once you read the blocks, you want to keep them in, in memory so you can do the next process faster, right? Otherwise, every time you have to go to the disk, you're gonna do lots of disk operations to open a file, right? That makes sense? And that brings up to the notion of at what you're pointing out, right? Which is, there are so many different file systems that you don't want to have a different interface for each file system, right? Um, what that means is, remember the, the, the mount command, right? So you can uh, mount slash temp, let's say using a RAM file system. In a, in a typical Unix machine, let's say Linux machine, you can mount it such that slash from the from the root, the slash term is a RAM file system, right? RAM file system is essentially a memory file system. Nothing ever gets written to the disk. You want things to be really fast, right? So you can use your extra memory here for file system. And then let's say you have a directory called slash win, which has an NTFS and uh, user, which is a ext3 Linux file system, right? Without knowing the details, let's say that we, we have this way, right? If you do it the right way, meaning if you do it such that each file system will export precisely what it can do, 
this file system will have a notion of ACLs, right? We, we never talked talk about it, but remember, like I said, Windows has a new notion of multiple groups rather than one single group, right? So this has a notion of multiple groups, right? Whereas this only has a notion of user, group, and other, right? Because it's a Unix file system, that's what you expect, right? If you leave it like this, then you'll be able to use the full Windows system here, but you'll be able to, you'll lose some of the functionality when you go here, and things may be drastically different here, right? And that makes the implementations pretty hard because you have to define different, different file systems doing different stuff. So the way we, they do that is through a VFS, right? All Linux file systems will have to implement a virtual file system, right? Virtual file system does not mean writing anything onto the disk. It means that you only have certain operations that all file systems have to support. They either have to support or not support, but you can't use extra stuff, right? So here the idea would be, actually, you are so user, right? It can say over here, I'll only allow POSIX, right? Whatever the POSIX standard would allow you to do. Over here, I will provide create group, say open file, right? If you want to, inst if you want to do NTFS, you have to implement, implement this open for NTFS specific stuff, right? Such that it implements this particular functionality, right? And if you want different different file system, you may change this to whatever specific to your file system, but you're only allowed to interact using this VFS interface. If you want to implement a new concept, you can't because it has to go through the VFS interface. So for example, if you want to in introduce the notion of a, a ACL, and if the VFS does not support it, you can't do it, right? In your homework project, you're essentially using a VFS the fuse lets you give, gives you a VFS where you can change all the parameters, right? And when you go through the stuff, you'll see that it can do certain things, but it can't do something else, and that's the price you pay, right? So once you do the stuff, writing a new file system is very trivial, like you'll see, you're seeing for your course project, right? Uh, for your, uh, for your uh, next project. Essentially, you implement these functions that you want for a file system. You tell VFS that I'm going to now create a new file system, which is your file system, and it only supports these functions. Users will continue to operate whichever way they want. If your file system does not support a certain functionality, then that doesn't happen at all, right? If somebody wants to open a, f open a file, and you don't define a notion of file at all, there's no function in here, then it just proceeds, right? It just leaves, leaves it at that. But if you want to implement a new new function called new uh, function, you can't do that because there's no equivalence for this, right? And and this will this will be more clear when you when you look at the the interface for the fuse. How, how many of you looked at the fuse examples so far? So you should look at the fuse interface because you know it it can be easy, but it it can also trip you, right? It's easy because it essentially has open, close, and all those things which you, you, you use for the stuff. So for example, one of the things that you may want is you want to know who's opening a file, right? Who's opening a file is something that you may want to know, but the VFS interface may not give that to you, right? Which means that you can't implement that. You can't use that, right? Because it's not supposed to be given to a file system. Um, right? Yeah? So who defines the virtual file system interface? Is that specific the VFS? to OS? The VFS? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's specific to OS. Um, it's it's a you know it it evolves through a process of sort of consensus, right? Um, it was defined defined by Sun at some point because they had to do that for uh, NFS, and it's been used kind of evolves very slowly. Yeah. So is the VFS used on Windows machine the same one that's used on Linux? Oh, um, Windows does not have to use a VFS the same way as Linux has to, right? I mean, Windows is only one organization, so they can choose to have the, Windows is a little different, right? Windows is it's one vendor, right? So they don't have to support all these different file systems, so they don't have to do a 
BFS, right? But I think they do, but I, I'm not sure of, of the entire details. Yeah, so like you get all the like, files making Linux on Windows, so I mean, there must be some kind of... But it doesn't have to go through the kernel in this elegant way, okay. right? I, I'm, I'm suspect they do, but it's a lot more open on, on the Linux side, right? So if, if you write a file system that you want to put in Linux, you can argue to extend the VFS, right? Whereas in the case of uh, Microsoft, you just work with Microsoft, right? So, but NTFS is a lot more, lot powerful file system than any of these systems. You know, NTFS can, you know, the access control is a lot powerful than any of the Unix variants, right? So providing this virtualization may or may not be that trivial because NTFS is a lot, is a lot more powerful than people give it credit for, right? Um, yeah, but I'll, so this, this is mostly Linux centric, Linux centric because you know this is this is easier to define um, uh, new file systems and go from there. Um, so essentially, you write a file system. You write the file system to the to the VFS uh, interface, not to the regular file system, not to the underlying file system, right? Which you could do, but that, that's a lot more messy, and people don't want you to do that, right? So, you know, if you want to do illustration, essentially you have the um, you have the VFS interface, right, which defines what the the users can access from the top, from the from the uh, from the top. So, whatever the you know whatever can be implemented on the top could be passed on to the underlying local file systems. So, if you want to define a new uh, functionality, unless the VFS interface supports it, you can't do that. But the, but the benefit is, once you do the stuff, I can have different file systems. I can have, um, I raised the example of like Windows and all those things. You don't know the difference, right? You know the difference if you kind of care for specific stuff, but for the most part, you don't know the difference, right? So one, one, one nice thing to do on, on um, two commands you can do on Unixes is Mount and DF, right? Mount will tell you all the file systems that are mounted. So if you look at the mount, it'll tell you there are different file systems and what, what file system is actually, what's the name of the file system. And you can see there are many file systems that you're using and you don't know the difference because they're all going to the v, uh, VFS interface, right? And hopefully, I mean, uh, not hopefully, you will understand a lot more of VFS because your course project essentially implements uh, you know, using a VFS interface, your know, particular file system, right? Fuse essentially is a file system which is, which reports to the kernel, and, and it implements the the um, VFS interface, right? So, the the next next issue, you know, once you start implement the file system, is the notion of directories. Like, how do you hold how do you hold the directory? Um, so, the implementation of directory in the conceptual sense is this stuff with Lots of files, right? Let's say this is a directory entry. This is file. This is file, and so on and so forth, right? So, the if I want to open a file, I have to open the direct, corresponding directory, and I have to find the file, right? So I can either do a linear search, start, start from the top and search to see where my file is, or my particular file is, and if if, it, if it's there, then I open the corresponding file control block, right? Which is the linear search. Or I can do a hash search or whatever. So these are stuff to improve the search performance on the directory itself, right? Why would I care about the search performance on the directory? Yeah, I mean, it's just like a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a file. Yeah, so yeah, every time you open a file, if I open a lot of files, then I need to be able to search through the stuff, right? So, can you think of reasons why you would want linear over hash functions? Yeah. You're doing entirely sequential reading. Uh, so it 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 may or may not be right. So when you create, let's say you create file one, file two file three, right? And then you delete file four, and then you create file five, right? The directory entry may happen to be file one, file five, F3, F2, and so on, right? It can be written in any order, right? Not an order that you're 
you're writing because the history, you know, it, it's, it says forever, right? So even though it's sequentially, you may be doing F1, F2. So if you do F1, F2, F3, uh, let's say F4, you create these things, and then you read them as F1, F2, F3, F4, F5, right? These need not be sequential anymore because you know the it may be written in a different different sense, right? This kind of goes back to why you, why you use hash functions, right? When is linear is good enough? Yeah, if you have a small number of files, linear is good enough, right? You want to go for hash if you have a large number of files, right? So that's the magic key of figuring out whether you want to go for hash or whether you want to go for linear, right? And this goes back to another thing that people always do, which is tune the file system to the modern workload. So, if, so somebody has to look to see how many files do typical users have in each directory. And based on that, define whether you want to do a hash-based or linear-based, and you implement the different stuff, right? And of course, different directories will have a different number of files. You know, something on the your your program directory may have a lot more files than your project directory, and so on and so forth. So you're trying to find a good point where they, these both match, right? You, you either go for a hash or linear, what have you. But the idea here is you want the structure to be compact and easy to search because every time you open a file you go through the directory structure, right? And in terms of allocation, right, in terms of allocating this block, you know, here I say block one, block two, block three, right? We'll, we'll see why you may want to do contiguous allocation, and that goes with the, the particular medium you use. Right? So for example, if you're using a disk, disk is a lot similar to sort of like your CD or your record player kind of thing, where it goes in a certain fashion, right? So if disk looks like this, and there's a reading arm which is reading the con context, right? So it's good to be close to where all the things are close together rather than something here and here and here and here because then you have to keep going all over the place, right? So it's good to have contiguous. That means you allocate a whole bunch of blocks together, right? But if you keep them contiguous, then you create problems with in terms of holes and stuff. So there are different ways of allocating um, what you ask for, disk blocks, right? The, 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 the simple allocation is contiguous allocation. So I, I, I give you, if you ask for five blocks, I give you a contiguous set of five blocks, right? And the link allocation, every block tells you the index of where the next block is, um, link allocation. And the index allocation, you keep a directory of all the other blocks, right? I'll, I'll briefly say what they are before uh, we, we leave, right? So. Contiguous allocation is, is you know, it, it, we, we kind of looked at it from the memory memory side. You know, you have a set of blocks that you allocate. So you know the start, you know the end. Every block inside belongs to the, to the particular file. So you can say from here to here, all the blocks belong to a particular file, right? It's, it's good because you get good performance. It's bad because you create a lot more fragmentation, right? And files cannot grow. So if you have a file here and this start was allocated to another file, you can't grow unless you move the directories, right? So for example, if you, know, if you have a disk like here, so you may say the, the file called count is from zero to two, uh, different files are in different blocks. So they're allocated contiguously, right? If you see the follow the gray bar. But if you want to add a new file, you have to find, try to find a hole between what you currently have, right? And I'll, I'll stop after I finish this one. So essentially, so some of the file systems do it, uh, use this model by having extent based, where they say, anytime you ask for a block, I'll give you 10 blocks, and all of them are contiguous, right? The next 10 blocks may be in a different location using some other techniques we'll see otherwise, but I'll still get the benefit of contiguous allocation for a small enough size, right? And when you go become larger, then you have to do a stuff, right? And these are used in a like Veritas file system, which are enterprise scale file systems where we are worried about performance and not about the storage being wasted. Right? If you have lots of small files, you still get extent, which is a lot bigger than what your file is. You get good performance, right? And we'll continue with that on Monday, right? So yeah, um, yeah, do go through the you know, the program before you, you come on Friday. Um, hopefully that'll be useful, right? <laughs>